How do we make decisions in a world full of random data? And let's take an example of how you decide who to marry. An Australian band called The Whitlams have a song that says, she was one in a million. So there's five more just in New South Wales. So is it one in a million? One in a hundred perhaps? How do we decide? I thought I'd take a quick look at what maths has to say about it. To build a mathematical model, you might think about a compatibility scale. So cast your mind back to when you first started thinking about having a relationship. You probably had a good idea of what zero compatibility is, but you don't really know what the maximum amount of compatibility is for you. So you might find a person who you think is very compatible, but you may also wonder if there are others out there who are even more compatible. The problem is at the start, you don't really know where most people sit on this compatibility scale. What's the average compatibility of people? What's the variance amongst the population? So how do you choose? Of course, it does depend if you like to make decisions with your head or your heart, and I'm certainly not going to claim that everyone makes these decisions the same way. But let's see what maths has to say about it. I'm going to suggest that people's compatibility criteria can be divided into three classes. Essential, which are qualities that you think a partner really must have. Important, which are qualities that are important to you but not necessarily essential. And desired, qualities that you'd really like in a partner but you could live without. And I'm going to suggest that they map onto the compatibility scale in this way. So it's only those people at the very top of the scale who meet all three classes. Now, for a range of reasons, it's reasonable to model the population distribution as a bell-shaped curve. The parameters of this curve depend on your personal criteria for compatibility. If you got a very specific criteria, your curve will look like this, where most people won't even meet your essential criteria. Uh, if you're more easygoing, your curve will look like this. The question is, how do you know what your curve looks like? And how do you set a threshold above which you'll be willing to propose marriage? If you set the threshold too high, you might find there's no one who qualifies and you'll spend a long time looking for them. So you might decide to set the threshold at the compatibility value where let's say 5% of the people are above that value. So how do you go about learning the parameters of this curve? Well, you need to start assessing people for compatibility against your personal criteria. And you'll need to do this learning phase before you'll be able to locate your top 5% compatibility threshold and then switch into a decision-making phase or a marriage proposal phase. And this poses a big question. How many people do you need to assess? Or perhaps a slightly different, but in many ways more important question, how many relationships should you have before proposing marriage? Or to be more mathematical, how many relationships do you need to have in a learning mode in order to accurately measure your bell curve? before you switch into having decision-making relationships. Remember, you can't go back and decide on someone you've previously rejected. To keep things simple, let's assume you randomly select people to assess. For every person, you learn about their compatibility to you and it fills in the measured distribution. And if you assess lots of people, then you'll learn the full curve. The more people you assess, the more accurate the curve will be estimated. However, in practice, you really don't want to spend too much time in the curve learning phase. At some point, you actually do want to decide on your selection threshold and put it to use. So how accurate do you need to be in learning the curve? This equation holds the answer. It tells us the relationship between the number of samples and the variance of the estimate of the Gaussian curve's variance. And if that sounds like a bit of a mouthful and you'd like to know more about it, then you can look out for an upcoming video on the channel. It will explain all this maths in more detail. In summary though, it tells us how accurately we can estimate the width of the bell curve. So let's put some numbers on this. Let's assume your compatibility criteria mean that the true population bell curve has these parameters, but of course you don't know these values and you want to learn them. Let's assume that you want to estimate the mean and variance to within 40% accuracy. Let's look at two possible curves you might measure from your random selection of people with this 40% level of accuracy. In this case, you'd be using the threshold shown in pink, which is below where it really should be. And you could end up proposing marriage to someone who you think is in the top 5%, but really they're not. In this case, the threshold you'd be using is above where it really should be. And you could end up missing out on proposing marriage to someone who really is a top 5% person when you think they're not. So perhaps we want to be a bit more accurate than 40%. Let's choose 20%. It's a trade-off because the more accurate you want to be, the more people you are going to need to assess. So using the formula we have here, it tells us that you would need to assess 52 people to get a 20% level of accuracy in your measured curve. Does that sound like a lot of people? Of course, you don't need to have relationships with them all. 
in order to assess them for compatibility. It's pretty easy to assess people for the essential criteria just by meeting them. And for the important criteria, it's probably good enough to just be friends with them. So really, it's only the top end people who you will need to have relationships with in your curve learning phase. Let's say we define the top end to be only people who are more than 1.2 standard deviations above the mean. In this case, that's six out of the 52 people. Now let's think about what happens when you switch into your selection phase. Again, you won't need to have relationships with most of the people you're randomly meeting, only the ones that you assess to be at the top end. To give an idea of that, this equation gives the expected number of relationships you'll need to have during your selection phase to find a top 5% person. And the answer is 3.2. So the answer to the original question, how many relationships should you have before you decide to marry, is, well, according to maths and assuming the accuracy requirements we have here and making all the assumptions we've made along the way, it's a minimum of six to measure the curve and decide on where your decision cutoff should be. And then you can expect to need to have another 3.2 on average to find someone over that cutoff. So that's 9.2 relationships. If you're willing to have a top 10% person, then it would be 7.6 relationships. Do these numbers sound about right? Too many? Too few? I'll leave it up to you to make of this what you will. After all, this is just a mathematical model. But it might just give your head something to think about in its battle with your heart in the marriage proposal decision process. If you found the video interesting, give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos. And you can check out the web page in the link below, which has a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.